uh, some announcements um, for today. We've got um, Summer 2020 Design Challenge, which will be due by the end of September. And then at the start of October, um, I will by then hopefully uh, announce and post the Harvest Design Challenge, which I have already told you guys is a creature harvest design. So basically the creature is a harbinger of the harvest season. And you're just um, uh, associating elements with them. Be they a creature that changes the colors of the leaves, a creature that basically what you would see in a game, an elemental creature of sorts for the harvest season or the changing of the, of the fall into the fall season, or the changing of the seasons. Um, be they uh, the, the, you know, the, the frost bringer, I don't know. Cute fucking creature designs, okay? Um, and that will be announced for the 1st of October. I hope everybody joins. It'll be the same old requirements for all challenges, thumbnailing, research, um, all of that stuff. Um, so my window is open. I can't turn it. I can't close it because it's an old house and I hurt my back when I try to close that fucking window. So you're going to have to hear the traffic with me. I don't think I can do it though. I don't think I can. Ah, oh, son of a bitch. sound wasn't me closing the window that was just me getting out of my chair <laughs> joking um so i had to because i can't i can't hear that shit while i'm while i'm fucking teaching uh what was i saying i'll try to cut this off out of the recording um but yes all the same requirements for every challenge so all the research all the planning mood boards research uh for like reference boards uh, research for thumbnails and um, influence maps of some kind, other artists, uh, inspirational stuff. I will probably upload a resource pack this time around, but I might not. Just because the free reign has really brought in a lot more uh, people. But if I do upload the resource pack, I will put it up on Dropbox and post the link with the post on Reddit. Um, and then another announcement, Portrait Studio price did go up. I am sorry, but it, it did not go all the way up um, uh, to the original price. Uh, it's still technically a, a sale price, uh, but it's, it's still very affordable, I hope, uh, or similar to the other um, uh, prices that you've seen this year. The brush bundle is still on sale, though. I've kept that on sale um, just for anyone who wants to catch up and get all the brushes without buying every single individual brush. Um, and then uh, Patreon, if anyone wants to join on Patreon, you may do so. Uh, if you want to support uh, the channel, you can join as a watcher. It's $12 a year. Um, and you want to keep this community alive, you can do so through Patreon. Okay, so this piece here, uh, I think was posted by the same vagabond that posted the oversaturated environments from last time. And I posted uh, quite a bit of lessons on depth in the past couple of months. So, I'm just gonna go to my channel real quick and um, just try to show you guys how many videos I got. Okay, so we've got environments in depth, got some depth here, got some depth here. Uh, I believe there was another one on depth right here. Would you look at that? I got some slight depth over here. Depth and volume. All right, it just keeps coming. All right, so if you, I think this has some depth in it as well. This was a fun one. Um, but I, I'm not sure why it is that, you know, you guys are having such a hard time executing the depth in your illustrations, considering I've covered this topic really as much as I've covered lighting. Um, but please take advantage of my channel because I make videos and I upload them and you guys don't go on my channel and check my videos. <laughs> it kind of sucks that I upload so much content and you guys aren't taking advantage of it. <laughs> it's really a lot of knowledge. Like, I don't know if you guys noticed. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so the rules of depth that I will skim over today are explained thoroughly in the last couple of sessions. 
on depth that you'll find on my channel history. So make sure you go there. If you feel like I covered over something too quickly, it is because I cannot go in depth in the depth. Okay, so pun intended. I ain't no coward. I intend my puns. So I'm going to try to see if I can select the foreground. So what are the rules about the foreground in the rules of depth? What's the rule? What does it say? What do we do to the foreground? Does anyone remember? Foreground is dark or beautiful. God, I love this low latency stuff. Um, so if the foreground is darker and we're having a sunset style silhouette set up where the background light is behind the foreground, we have even more reason to darken the foreground. Again, if you don't know what silhouette even means, go to my videos, search the word silhouette, go to the little, the little, um, search thing. Uh, I'm going to just, I just have to show people this real quick. Um, so you can go on my videos and you can search right here you just click the word silhouette and you find a bunch of stuff on what silhouette does you write the word depth but find a bunch of videos on depth um please use this resource i am a library i am the library of alexandria okay all right that's who i am so please use my library okay um so the foreground needs to be darker and bigger and possibly if you want to use cinematic and um I like photography or camera style uh staging you may want to blur the foreground as well <clears throat> so bear with me i'm just selecting Okay, so can anyone, I mean, I'm going to let you guys kind of run most of this. What's the next step after darkening the foreground? What are we doing to the light environment? What is another issue that kind of sticks out? This person diagnosed themselves by saying that it's oversaturated. Is it oversaturation? Is that the problem? <clears throat> atmospheric fade, decide on a time of day, adding atmospheric haze, unifying the light environment, how so? Unify the light environment, how so? Um, so how do we do that? Find color of the sky, paint low opacity layer in the background. Beautiful lighthouse, that's how. So the color of the sky is the color of the environment, that's the rule. So before I do that, I'm going to before I darken the foreground, I'm just going to run a quick color layer. That's what I do every time, a color layer and a darkened layer. So the color layer should account for the unusual orangeness of the sand here that looks like a carrot or one of Trump's butt cheeks. Okay, ew! <laughs> I haven't had anything to eat, but I'm about to puke my water, I swear to God. And then I'm darkening the foreground. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so the darkened foreground is right here. There is a light source in the environment, which is this guy. This light source can remain saturated. But before we continue and make this any more dark, let's adjust the light in the background. So. When we have a sunset, do we not do this? When you guys paint a sunset, do you not radially apply value toward the direction of the sun and then just keep piling up the value? Don't you do that? Doesn't light radiate? I mean, last I checked, light radiates. I don't know about you guys. I mean, it's up to opinion, really. Science is all up to opinion nowadays. But I think light does radiate. Um, pretty sure it does. So, use your radial shading. All right, two things we did that absolutely transformed the piece. Just two things, two things, that's it, just two things. I should be on video because I'm doing the, 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 the Trump hand gestures. Um, so before, 
Two things, just two. We darkened and unified the colors of the foreground. And we added a little bit of radiation for the light, which is what it is. Light radiates. That's why it's called radiation, gamma radiation. Every, everything radiates. So radiation doesn't mean radioactive. It just means it, it radiates. It sends out energy. All right. Two things, but there's still more to do. Ooh la la. There's still so much more to do. So we can, that's why it's called a radiator. Exactly. <laughs> we can darken the foreground even more. So I like to saturate when I darken because if we darken without saturating, we get this grayness. Do you see that grayness? And you can darken this much. I think that's a little too much because I don't want to lose too much detail, but it is a very possible choice. But I like to saturate. If I saturate though, I might accidentally get that, um, that color in the sand back. So I'm just going to saturate a touch and then darken a touch more. Uh, I don't need to darken the foreground any more than this because it is technically a very bright, like, um, honestly, I think this is too bright, but if it's a fantasy world, then we get away with it for the most part. But um, an explosion, this, this seems more like an explosion or some kind of um, immense energy release or something like that like a supernova or something, but again, it's up to you. I'm illuminating here. I'm gonna go back here and color correct just a touch more. If you're at a loss for what to do with beige stuff at night, beige stuff is yellow based. Anything yellow based at night turns gray or adapt the environment color, All right? Write that back to me. So stuff that was once beige comes blue or gray depending on the wash of the environment and then there's the fact that the water is reflecting almost none of this magnitude so I might use dodge tools since we're talking about flame we're talking about um, explosions or whatever this magical spell is and there's other ways to illuminate the sky you could have used dodge tool you could have used all kinds of stuff really I think where you placed, I mean, it depends on refraction or whatever the hell light does when it um, floats on water, but uh, really what I would do is try to treat it as like the most basic. Um, it just feels like the mountain would not really show the majority of the light. It's not a mirror reflection. There's a lot happening on the surface of the water. Um, the mountain shadow will be visible first and then we would get the light so we would get something like this you see what I'm saying so I feel like the mountain would cast it the light would cast a shadow because of the mountain just like that um, multiply just like that and then we've got what's happening in the sky. So if we're talking about like an Aurora Borealis, Northern Lights, whatever, you want to look up a reference so you can see exactly what happens. I gotta put my glasses back on. All right, so the secret to texture is do what the texture itself is doing, what the object is doing. Aurora Borealis, when you look at it, all you think is smudge. You know, everything looks so smudged together. So I'm going to smudge with my scatter brush number four. Okay. But I'm going to put smudge on a soft brush, which is a very, very powerful couple. And I'm going to start dragging the smudge brush upward. And that's kind of what we see when we look at the Aurora Borealis. That upward smudge. And you can go back and forth between scatter smudge and vertical smudge like this, or linear smudge, until you get the effect that you need. And make sure you shrink your brush the further it is that we're smudging. So the further the component is. If you're using a large brush to smudge, 
far away Aurora Borealis, you're going to make it look cheesy. So I'm really smudging some of these and I can just zigzag for the far away stuff because it's detail. And really the more you zigzag and you can combine it with a scatter brush as well to zigzag. Um, it doesn't have to, a scatter brush without the scatter option on, on tool settings. But let's just take care of this. It's taking up a lot of the, the canvas, this, um, this magic in the sky. So we have to actually put in some effort in rendering it. It's taking up a lot of space in the canvas, therefore it can't just be these really messy looking. I'm just going to zoom out. I also don't recommend them being as bright or as white. Some of these areas are almost as white as the light source. You've really thrown off your light source. So now I'm going to reattach the, um, re-equip <laughs> the number four smudge and then try to be selective with what I'm smudging on a scatter. So that's 33%. Make sure you bring that down. These are powerful brushes. Right, so I'm trying not to get that artificial ver linear smudge. I never smudge linearly, ever, except when it is required for a texture. I think at the very end I'm going to do a really, really cheeky little filter with the linear blur. Mm -mm -mm. That is going to look phenomenal. And then I'll just be selective with what is sharp. So there are areas like emission lines where we have um, sharp little cuts in the, in the Aurora Borealis. And the thing is with it is that it fades sort of, it kind of fades towards the top. So things kind of just blend together. All right, so right at the, see how zoomed out I am. Why am I this zoomed out, boys and girls? I'm going to over smudge the stuff at the edge of the canvas. It's not important. It's behind a tree. It's not where the viewer is going to look for optimal Aurora Borealis experience. So I'm just going to minimize it there. All right. And then those emission lines, like I promised, I'm going to use my, just that little brush there. Hmm. Kind of tricky. using the nearby value and just dragging it up. All right, and again, shrinking my brush, the further I get. Oh, motherfucker, I've been on multiply this whole time. No wonder I'm having it. And then I'm going to go back to smudging the tails of those because that was very dirty. Get better, uh, to get better idea of how it looks as a thumbnail. Excellent. It would look nice to have a light come from the bottom of the aura lines uh, because you're using a large brush at the moment. Yes, yes, yes. What was my question? <laughs> Forget the question I asked. But those all sound like great answers. <laughs> all right. And so what we have to do eventually is sharpen some of these. But for the most part, Aurora Borealis here in this painting should not superpower or, or you know, should not be a superpower of detail. It should not um, be the focal point. Everything kind of goes back to this explosion. Just have a general depiction of what's happening and you will not fail. So that next, because it's nighttime, I'm going to darken the top half of the canvas. Come on, zooming out again. Should not be that bright. There should not be areas that are that, you know, contesting uh, the, the focal point that much. <clears throat> 
So the thing is about the Aurora lines is that they get this nice sharp kind of like fabric to them um, that I want to pull off real quick. I'm just trying not to look up a reference just to test myself, but there are some areas that could use a bit of sharpness. But of course, please look up a reference. And I kind of just overlap in some of these areas like that. So it's like a, it's like a fabric study really. I'm just trying to show off how that happened. So this fabric is in front of that. And so we're getting these layers and then that fabric is in front of that. That's the best thing to do when you have a good codex, I guess, of fabric or different textures. You start noticing how these textures repeat themselves throughout different objects. And then you use them to help you render. And, um, I'm just going to keep smudging, as, the, as is the nature of the texture. And then there are just some areas that you can bring in Dodge Tool to show how they're a little bit more saturated areas that are a little bit hotter and I would make sure that they are areas that are close to the focal point. But you still have like some of these areas that are just a little too um, white. Okay and then you've got these greens which are daytime greens. Big mistake there is no daytime value here. Blue is dominating. That means that we shift the green to blue because there's different types of green. Do you guys remember that? Do you guys remember the noob, how you find the difference between a pro and a noob is how they use green? There's different types of greens. Green is an abundant color. Look how much green we have on the color wheel compared to every other color. It's a beautiful abundant color because it combines with both blue and yellow. It can be warm and cool. And so a noob will use a warm green where there is no warm sun to fuel it, or a cool green in a warm environment. Make sure that in a cool environment you are using cool greens. All I did was select and drag to the slider. And then we've got this massive explosion of light, supernova, that's hitting the, you know, the scene. And we have absolutely no cast shadows everywhere. Anyway, so I'm just going to grab this exact color. Again, these rules are simple. It's you guys who complicate them. I'm going to saturate it a little bit. And I'm going to delete that where I do not have any object on the surface or any light. And then I'm going to do that. Eh, eh, eh. And then. Ooh la la, look at that. Mmm, so simple, so easy. Who would have known? This whole time I'm telling y'all. But the fundamentals are simple and yes they can be complicated just because they are simple doesn't mean they're basic or basic doesn't mean simple but they are simple in that once you know them the execution is simple it's it, the only difference is that you're just not executing which is very sad see the most basic stupid you know sunset cast shadows i put in no effort i put in no effort on these cast shadows all right, and it's taken the scene somewhere else, which is really nice, right? Um, one thing I do want to do is just cool down the cast shadows a little bit um, with their own color. Oh, geez. You were doing it daytime. Like, you were, you, it was daytime. <laughs> okay. Wrong. Wrong. So I'm going to put that down. And I'm going to maybe color correct it. Um... I mean, I like the purple shadow, but it's a blue environment, so I'm just trying to unify the colors. <clears throat> I'm 
And that should be nice. And if you oversaturate cast shadows, it's just a beautiful thing. All right. And then because it's kind of like an explosion, I would say the cast shadows can stay sharp. But because I love blurring cast shadows, I'm just going to go ahead and blur it. But you can keep those purple cast shadows if you really wanted to. Uh, one thing I have to do is just get rid of some of this stuff because it is actually ruining the layer beneath. Just trying to hide it because it's um, bleeding through. And then uh, I'm going to just smudge. That should give me a cleaner finish. Um, so it's mostly the the what's actually dark is anything that is in the way of the light or anything that is in the foreground that is not flat on the surface. Because right now the sand is technically a part of hmm, technically a part of the stuff and the water that's receiving that ray of light that's hitting the surface of the earth. So you can keep that generally brighter. Of course you do have to fix the texture so that it reads as water on a shore. And then I really would exaggerate the the levels here. So just because that light is pretty strong. But we still keep things dark. You see what I'm saying? And I think the darker the better. But don't want to change too much outside of the original design or the intent. You you want to see the hut the hut. Maybe it's a game loading screen or something like that where the hut is needed. And I'm just going to find a cool blue. I mean, a cool green and color correct that tree. And then just darken that tree a bit more. There's more that I want to do to the to the, the northern lights here, or this magical spell. There's just um, like a lot of texture changes that you can do, stuff like that. I can figure it out. Oops. Now stuff like mm, no, that's not what I want. Just more obvious. Do you see what I'm doing here? So that it's it's a, that that's the base of it, or so like the inverse. I cut out with the negative space back here just to get more pattern and then smudge and vertically smudge um, that as well. Just like fabric studies. So we're just trying to show how it overlaps in front of itself. But there's still this rim of blue. Some of these areas here, just selecting some and sharpening bases. And this is kind of how we detail, and I still detail from a distance. Then I might blur that and smudge that.
And one thing I do want to do is burn in between. So that's a nice little amount of contrast there. You don't want to, let's say you're making this for a kid's game, you use less contrast for kid's games. But if this is sort of like a young adult game or general, whatever, anybody can play it, um, you, you want to use like a medium contrast. Um, and then if you're talking about, like obviously when you see games like like for like God of War or anything that requires maxed out realism for the immersion and the gore and whatever, God of Gore, um, or like Senua's Sacrifice, that's tons of contrast, tons of detail, basically I'm imitating and exaggerating what happens in real life. So the more cartoony, depending on your audience, the less contrast you, you still have enough, you just use less. So that's why I would be careful with pushing the black out here if it's supposed to be for children. If it's supposed to be something a little bit more dramatic, you know, you can introduce it. Um, then there's this like texture in the water that's you're using a pool reflection texture on the water. That's not really what, or like shallow water, like beach water. That's not what water does when it's like, I mean, if it's on a still beach, maybe. But water does ripples, and ripples from a distance look like lines. So you're actually much better off showing off where these lines are. And they're more like ripples, and they kind of get bigger the further they get from the water and they cast shadows as much as anything else does. And that's kind of how you can show that the explosion or whatever it is, is moving over the surface of the water. But at that point, it's really up to you what you're doing and how you're telling the story. I'm gonna just cool down that sand. It doesn't really bother me. I feel like it has been cooled down, but I'm just gonna make it a bit more pale. Um, I guess this is as much as I want to do for this piece right now. Let's take a look at the before and after. One thing that is bothering me is the inside of the hut is getting absolutely no light, but it's super bright. I'm just going to go ahead and make it a little bit darker. Not sure why the inside of the hut would get so much. God damn it, the aim is completely off. And then I would just sneak in some rim light wherever I can get away with it. Not everywhere. You don't want to flatten the form. Somewhere on the palm tree as well. And then this object here, whatever it is, you might want to darken it just a bit more. Complete the step. Okay. Um, another trick, it doesn't make sense, but it's used a lot and it looks good, is to pretend that the water is completely still and just completely reflect. <laughs> it looks good, but it makes no sense physically. Completely reflect the not sure how the hell this is done. All right, the surface, um, the, 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 the entire environment on the surface. Of course, you don't just do it like that. You have to erase away anywhere where we have any disturbance in the water surface or anything like that. And you do have to lower the opacity a bit but it kind of helps us feel like this is water. I mean, some people go for this, you know, and they don't really always compress it. Sometimes they just make it like that. And that also looks like still water. That's super cute. And it works for the 
a concept. So remember when I said it depends on your audience? If your audience is it's just supposed to be a kid's game or something like that, you can break a lot of rules of physics and make the water reflective even though it's active. You know, just so you can have some of those, um, just the aurora borealis here. Obviously, the reflection of the aurora borealis is not a, a face reflection. You have to show how it's wrapping, so we will see aurora borealis that we're not seeing because of our angle, like moving around because we're looking at it from, like as a reflection. So I would recommend like um, the bigger brush strokes, obviously. Stuff that moves around, just like that. <clears throat> but you can do the one before as well, or a combination of the two. If you do too much and then try to make everything work and lower the opacity everywhere on everything, um, then you might, you know, end up making things look super cheesy. So I, I try to cut out what I really want. So maybe the reflection of the island might be a nice idea at 100% even. 74% um, opacity. And... Um, you know, and just keep keep that, but not reflect the aurora borealis, just because I don't want it to be crazy. And I do need a little bit more rim light just on the edges right here. Right. And again, if it's a kid's game, it's, you know, there's no harm in, in just breaking some rules of physics. Like I said, it's a pretty light environment, and we're exaggerating a lot. If it's like a loading screen, it's going to last two seconds. You really don't need to uh, entertain every last rule of physics in it. Light blue light might be required there. Some rim light definitely on the rock surfaces. Maybe casting shadows on each other. Okay, um, so now that I think I might put a little bit more. So let's do the before and after. Before, after. Again, if you want to darken the as a like a gradient, the foreground, I wouldn't. But it's an option if you feel like the, the ground is too bright. You can darken the ground if you want that. Actually, it just works more like a like a sepia, not sepia, like a like a frame. But if the if the light really is that bright and there are cast shadows, it would be bright on the floor. It's really up to you. I I'm kind of in between both. Maybe darken out here, keep the earlier stuff. Okay, so now the light has a radiation. The reflection is a push, but it's fun because you get two of the same thing and the water actually looks like water. It's like the best way to make something look reflective is just take the picture and flip it. The aurora borealis is reading more. Oh, I forgot the linear blur. <laughs> Stupid. Filter, blur, um, motion blur. Uh, so I'm gonna make it 90 degrees. Let's see, you guys see that? It's really, really cool. It just blurs the whole dang thing. So before, after. And you can go back and select what you don't want blurred that much. So you can copy paste like I do and erase away what you want to keep. But I love the uniform blur that way. It actually looks like the same substance, the same object consistently, whereas the way we blur it isn't consistent, and I'd go back and keep what I want sharpened. So, so I would keep this stuff, you know, the sinewy stuff. I would keep this here. Just the base of all of the 
the aurora borealis like just this the lower part of it you know so that it looks like it's actually denser at the base of the chemical reaction and more dispersed the higher it moves up the atmosphere So before, after, definitely more realistic, uh, but I'm not sure how much of that realism you want to keep based off the style that you're after. So if you're after um, cartoony style, you might want to shift some stuff around. I do want to see what we can, ooh, green is pretty. Ooh. Ooh, Mordor. This is more towards purple. That's evil. This is that evil Elsa, bad magic, angry Elsa. And then we get into Care Bears. <laughs> and then we get into Donald Trump's butt cheek. Um, so this is where we are. Uh, you can shift more towards blue to get that nighttime scene and shift more towards yellow. Actually, there is no yellow because it's a little too dark. If I raise it, it's weird. Kind of looks green if we darken it back. Yeah, we have to raise it for it to look yellow. Um, there's a lot you can do, but yeah, shifting towards blue gets you more nighttime. Do that. Elsa Care Bear's Trump, right. <laughs> I find the Care Bear light the most frightening. Yeah, every, everyone's different. Everyone has experienced like colors in their childhood differently, you know, based off what they watched um, and what they, you know. It's got everything you can want. <laughs> yeah, green is very pretty. Um, does anyone have any questions at all? So I wanted to take a look at just to congratulate the student here, but also show them some mistakes for younger characters, even someone who's prepubescent or just slightly pubescent, you don't want to exaggerate the cupid's bow. And then you don't want to create too much of a distance from the mouth to the nose. That is too much. You can keep the mouth small. In my opinion, it is too small. It is unusually small, nervingly small. So give it the size that it needs for the jaw. The jaw is what you look at to create a proportionate mouth size. Just do not over exaggerate the cupid's bow. Because babies don't have that yet. That's the stuff you get later on. Babies have more of like a little hat shape, like a cowboy hat. Right. And I'm just making sure that's there. And then that looks a little bit more childlike. And then it's the placement of the eyebrows that don't really have eyebrow bone that's still making it look a little bit um, adult, you know, like, a, like, like an older character trapped in younger character proportions. You're really overdoing that nose bridge. The, the, the kid doesn't have a big nose bridge yet. Kids don't have a huge nose bridge. They don't have those shadows that us ugly old people have. <laughs> so you want to just relax with those. Not every face has the same shadows. Not every age has the same kind of shadow. We all have symmetry. We all have a bridge, but at different degrees. And that's, again, your responsibility to learn at what degree. Don't lose the brow bone. It's not something that is mostly like age. It is. It does change with age. Faces are, heads are more circular for um, for children. And don't overdo the eyebrows either so that it can actually look like a child. You don't have the core shadow of the nose everywhere. Make sure that it's everywhere and that you have edges on either side of the nose. That nostril is still too visible. For a small nose anyway. I really don't know what reference you used or what combination of references you used. What is photo reference and what is visual library. And then we've got the 
good old value sharing that students, even after they get a critique from Mr. Rack, still have. I don't know why I referred to myself like that. It sounded like a freak. <laughs> um, and then the inner corner. All right, so there's still some stuff that's kind of funny to me. Like this eye here is too close to the other eye. I feel like it's not even in the right position. I feel like that makes more sense than the one that's drooping back away from the face. It's not so much making the eyes look prettier, it's just where it's placed along the skull. So, before, too much shadow. Remember that Liam Neeson nose? Do you guys remember Liam Neeson nose? After we got rid of the shadows. That small mouth made it look like a man's face, but with girl eyes. You still have some ways to go. I really recommend getting rid of the hair. It's not doing you any help. It's not helping you. Quit it. Quit this narrative. Quit the story. Start a working day challenge of three quarter view and get on getting rid of these fundamental issues in your work. Congratulations to this 14 day challenger though, because I love it. All right, and I don't want any more bright background, so, cause that's some crazy business you got there. Um, and something you guys do, which I can recommend for this 14 day challenger is just to <sighs> stop with the swollen septums. Look up some references for what noses do. Uh, the older we get, the bigger our septums get, cause we, start to you know droop so make sure that the septum is thinner that you have for younger faces I don't really care what happens and what nuance and oh I've seen people with bigger septums it's not the point the point is learning templates that you can use while you're drawing while you're working for someone while you're creating faces um, you're not painting organic faces you're not you're painting beautiful people all the time you're gonna work on book covers character design illustration games you're drawing beautiful people learn how to draw a beautiful person so you can get paid um, and that's it for today thank you everyone for coming I really appreciate you guys being here being sarcastic you're absolutely right um, if you want a daytime would the sky be brighter uh, yeah the sky should be brighter and then the light source should be more yellow the blue light wouldn't dominate the sunlight, and we would have more warm greens. Um, this is a big improvement if the artist is in the chat. Well done. Yes. Um, do you use display tablet as stuff? So do you think it helps? I do not ever use and will never use a display tablet while teaching. I just feel like it slows me down. Being able to separate my tool, which is my hands and my pen, from my screen, uh, it gives me more control over my keyboard, which helps me with critique hour. Helps me work faster because I know where all the tools are where if my screen and my tablet are the same thing, then I'm constantly staring at my screen, moving my mouse, seeing my hands move over the screen. I like that sort of projector feel. And then um, there's the fact that I, I wanna zoom out and I don't want to have to worry about my hands accuracy. I can worry about my hands accuracy kind of nulled with it's bad through the tablet and then again projected on the screen where my hand jitter would just be visible while I'm while I'm teaching if I am um, if, if I'm using a display tablet um, so these hours fly by yeah they really do thank you everyone for coming I appreciate everybody who comes to the live streams you guys are so wonderful to join me here today live all of you are somewhere behind the desk watching live I really appreciate it um, if you guys are interested in joining the community challenges or joining the community to submit your work so that your work can be in these videos, go to istabrak.com and click on the Reddit icon. Portrait Studio is still very much affordable. Um, definitely not the price it used to be, but it did go up. Uh, brushes are still on sale at the same price. All the brushes you saw me use today, like the smudge brush, um, are all available on my uh, store. Um, the book cover challenge is right here. Soon after the book cover challenge, we'll have the harvest season character design challenge. I've already given you guys a brief for that. Um, I don't like when you guys start them too early, but for those who aren't interested in this challenge can get started early on for their creature design harvest season, uh, creature design challenge. Um, and then there is Patreon. If you guys learned something today and you appreciate what you've seen and you want to give back, you can join this patrons. You can even just join as a watcher. Anything that goes towards the community helps prolong the community's um, uh, success and promote its longevity. And that's it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'll see you guys on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. I'm officially clocked out for the week. Now back to housework and painting and stressing out about countertops. 
All right, I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Bye.